Now, Dan, uh, in this interview, I want to talk to you about the role of Electrotech in geopolitics or how geopolitics will uh, affect the rollout, the adoption of, of Electrotech around the world. And the I want to start off by uh, t discussing whether or how the definition of energy security is changing. In the West, especially fossil fuel exporting nations like Canada and the United States, energy security means enough oil and gas at a, an acceptable price that everybody has as much energy as they want. But in the electrotech world, in, in particular China is the, the best example of this, energy security means manufacturing your, uh, your energy, uh, you know, wind, uh, wind turbines and solar panels and, and so on. And you do it domestically. You buy that technology once, then you generate your your energy domestically inside your country and you then have the devices like electric vehicles and heat pumps to turn the electricity into the services and work that that you need and what that says is that that those uh, countries will not need oil imports they will not need lng imports because they are going to harness electricity to provide the kind of security that they uh, value the most Yes, quite right. So, so just to set the just set the scenery of of um, global energy security today, um, seventy five percent of global population lives in countries that are net importers of fossil fuels. Twenty five percent is importing fossil fuels worth more than five percent of GDP. So it's like a serious money leak out of countries. I think fifty countries in the world have more than fifty percent of their uh, primary energy supply coming from fossil imports. So import dependency is widespread throughout the world. The majority of the world is looking for ways always to reduce that dependency. Now, there was only one playbook so far to reduce energy dependency because there was just a fossil system and you need fossils. And no matter how deep you dig, if I sit here in New York City on the rock, of Manhattan, you will not find oil if you dig. So I will always need to import. So there's one way is diversification of import sources and stockpiling. That's basically what I can do. And that's the old guard of energy, uh, energy security. Electrotech is changing that fundamentally. It's changing it fundamentally because of course, I mean, as you put it already, once you have a solar panel up and running, you can put that anywhere in the world, by the way, because the sun shines on the whole world. You can have your own energy generated in your own country. When you look at the world, the global population, every country in the world has enough renewable potential to power their whole own energy system. Not just electricity, I mean, I literally mean energy system. So if you, can, if you electrify all economies around the world and you want to run them on renewables, that's possible with the renewables within your own country. And so there is this great energy abundance out there of renewable electricity, where all of these countries who are desperately looking for an alternative to fossil imports, because it's getting riskier and riskier to do so. And at some point as they look around, they will also look up to the skies and go like, hey, there's a sun there and I can put a solar panel here. And if I do that, then I have a energy security for as long as that solar panel lives, because that solar panel might last for 30 years. And so for 30 years, you can get electricity out of that panel. And in the meantime, I mean, no matter how hard a you know, a trade partner tries to put tariffs on me or whatever, they can't take the sun away from me. So they might make it harder for me to replace the panel if, it, if there's a hailstorm or something else. So there's still some import risk, but the fundamental risk of I can just be squeezed off, they can just squeeze off my economy and economic activity completely disappears when you run your economy on sunshine rather than on fossil fuels. And that is the radical change in geopolitical strategy that Electrotech now allows is that energy security is no longer just a game of diversification and stockpiling, but it's now a game of deploying Electrotech as fast as possible to get secure energy into your, into your country. I, I, yes, that's exactly what, exactly right. And uh, when we say Electrotech, in this context, we need to, to uh, divide it into supply side and demand side. So on the supply side, you know, we're talking about solar panels, wind turbines and batteries and maybe some hydro dams and maybe some, some nukes. Uh, but it's really on the demand side that the revolution has taken place. The, the, because we, we generated elect, uh, electricity for 125, 150 years. We know how to do that, whether we're doing it with, uh, with uh, clean tech or whether we're using uh, combustion technologies. But it's on the demand side that we couldn't electrify. We couldn't 
uh, electrify uh, cars, for example. Now, we tried that 100 years ago and with some success, but they relied on lead acid batteries, which just couldn't provide the kind of uh, range and, uh, and uh, energy density that gasoline could, pro could provide. So, uh, but now we can do that. And we can completely electrify our homes for both uh, heat and, and, uh, and cooling. And we can create uh, industrial heat that we couldn't do at scale uh, in the past. We need heat batteries and all sorts of technologies that are coming into, the, uh, into that space in the last uh, few years. So when you add all of those together from, like, say, China's point of view, uh, Malaysia, Taiwan, what, or uh, Thailand, whatever it is, uh, they look at that and go, okay, we can generate electricity domestically, we don't have to import LNG or oil, and we can deploy all of these other technologies that now do things very efficiently, very low cost in, inside our economy. I mean, that is the definition of energy security that the West simply doesn't understand yet because it's still thinking in that old mindset. Yes, exactly. And, and, and that is stopping the West from actually, if we're talking, for instance, specifically about Europe here, it's stopping, it's, it's, it's putting the brakes on Europe actually gaining energy independence when it like very, very, very desperately needs it with the uh, gas prices going up and the ongoing war in Ukraine. And so it, it's, it's, about, it's a high time uh, in Europe, but I think across the West that we start realizing that the game has changed. This is no longer a pure play molecule energy security uh, geopolitics that we're talking about. There's a new game in town. And, and this is exactly what we're seeing happening around the world across emerging economies, a boom of solar panel export of electric vehicles and all of these demand side technologies. And you're quite right. This is, again, this is quite a turnaround. And, and we talked in a previous conversation about, you know, how we need to change our priors because things that we that were true five years ago are no longer true. Um, and, you, and you mentioned the most important one there is that the amount of the economy just in aggregate that we can electrify today, if we would be talking like 10, 15, maybe 20 years ago, we'd probably be talking about, oh, a third of the economy we can perhaps electrify. Isn't that exciting? And maybe not even half of that is actually economic, but we can push it and perhaps get there. Today, we can comfortably say that 75% of the global economy, you can electrify with, you know, electric vehicles, heat pumps, electric heating, this kind of technologies. 75% comfortably you can electrify, probably an additional 10 to 15% is technically possible. And it's only that last sliver of uh, energy demand that we not yet have um, um, electric solutions for. And so that's a huge turnaround. So again, what we can do now is not just harvest electricity from the sun in place, uh, but also deploy that and power the vast majority of our economies with it. And that's very different than, than even like 10 years ago. There's another angle to this, which is the, the cost of building uh, oil and gas infrastructure in the, the global south versus electrotech and renewables. And if you, you know, the, the argument often is made that, oh, my God, we have to stick with oil and gas because of energy poverty and all these, you know, these uh, economies in uh, rural Africa and so on that don't have, you know, access to, to adequate energy. They're burning dung to, to you know, cook their meals and, and so on. But what that what that ignores is the fact that building uh, one of the reasons why they they don't have access to oil and gas is the cost to get the build that infrastructure out to their yes. local economy is enormous, enormous. Yes. You're, you're basically building, you know, 25, 50, 75 year infrastructure, sometimes even more. Whereas if you're sitting in a village in, in Africa, you know, that doesn't have access, you can, you can buy or the government can buy for you solar panels you put on your roof, hang from your balcony even, a little battery and uh, you're off to, off to the races. You've now electrified your home. Or if you're, say, a small factory in one of these countries and you can do essentially the same thing. Uh, so the technology now, the distributed energy technology, this is something we don't talk about enough, how this is being received in the global south. And Pakistan is, is the biggest example. You know, and last year they imported so many solar panels that into, I think it was like a $1.6 billion worth of them, that the demand on the already stressed grid dropped 9% because people were generating the, the electricity on their balconies and, and their roofs. And that is just one little peek into the potential to build out electro tech, electric tech, uh, uh, infrastructure much, much faster than oil and gas infrastructure.
It is. So it, it's exactly the battle that we're now currently seeing playing out in the emerging markets. It's, it's what we call the battle of the overcapacities, right? So on the one hand, uh, the LNG industry has been very enthusiastic to build a lot of capacity into the market. So we have an overhang at the moment that's only getting worse on the supply side for uh, LNG. And so desperately, LNG suppliers are trying to lock in long term contracts in emerging markets. And on the other hand, of course, we know in China there's a tremendous overcapacity in battery manufacturing and solar manufacturing. And they're also trying to find offtake for that overcapacity. And so LNG is largely led by American companies and, and, and uh, uh, solar panels and batteries are largely le led by Chinese companies. And so this is the titan battle that we're seeing across the world right now. These two overcapacities, they're both bidding into these emerging markets. The interesting thing, though, is, is that because LNG is such a big, bulky um, uh, technology to deploy, right? Large LNG terminal, pipelines, centralized grid with a gas power station, is you need to make deals with larger companies or larger organizations. It's going to take a, you know, 10 years to all set up. It's going to be billion dollar projects. Whilst these Chinese companies can almost directly market to final consumers and say, hey, we have a solar panel here for you. For a total cost of a few thousand dollars, you could take your entire house sort of off the grid or some houses are not even on the grid today and you can just you get electricity access with it and you can do it piecemeal house by house in a very quick way and within a few months you can already get up and running and so this in this battle this titan battle we clearly see that these chinese electrotech companies have the advantage but it's also because on the other side of the fence the lng deal is i just have to say it's incredibly poor right it's LNG is the most one of the most expensive energy sources that we know. Just the transport and distribute, like the transport, the gasification, transport, regasification, uh, costs you th th four to five dollars per MBTU. So this is really it's the caviar of energy, LNG. And so the, the the oil and gas sector has almost this sort of Marie Antoinette attitude of saying like, oh sure, like all the poor need energy. Let them have the most expensive energy source that we know, right? It's caviar for the hungry. That's the LNG play, and that just it just doesn't really fly. And we're seeing that hard reality set in uh, right now. Well, uh, let's talk about an, an example of that. Uh, India, I was reading a Bloomberg story just this morning uh, that India has a set of regulations or a law that they're considering, and it looks like it's going to pass, uh, where they will deliberately exclude LNG from uh, their uh, 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 their gas stations, their gas power generation stations on their power grid. And the reason for that is that it's just way too expensive. Their domestic industry can't produce enough gas to keep these gas power stations uh, going. And so when they bring in LNG, it just all becomes uneconomic. And I interviewed an Indian economist last year, and she said, that in order to be competitive uh, in the Indian power market, uh, gas would have to sell for $5.50 a MMBTU. Well, Canada, for example, uh, the cost there is $9.50 per MMBTU. And there's just no way it could possibly be brought down and then transported over to India, regasified, put into a plant at competitive prices. And I think that is an example we're seeing now and we'll see increasingly where, you know, glo uh, uh, global south economies are going to look at the economics and go, no, I don't think so. I don't think LNG is going to do it for us. And they're going to go into, they're going to adopt electric tech, electro tech, even if it's powered by coal, which they have lots of and it's cheap. That may be, you know, anathema to climate activists, but for, for emerging economies that, you know, uh, put more emphasis on economic development as opposed to climate issues. That's clearly the direction they're going. It's uh, it's very true, and this this coal part. It's it's slightly wrong to say that the battle or that the that emerging economies currently facing sort of two bids that to come in: the the Chinese solar bid and the American LNG bid. There's a third bid that typically comes in. That's coal. That's also, by the way, Chinese companies. It's Chinese coal. They offer to build coal power in in your country. And so this is also the, the tricky spot, I think, that the LNG industry is currently in, is that if you sell this idea that batteries and solar are never going to give you the reliability of gas, if, if you convince emerging economies of that, then they'll say, oh, great, then I'll go for coal, because that's the cheap sort of re uh, reliable option. 
Of course, most of them will do the maths and find out actually this is not an issue and we can go for this option just with a little bit of backup diesel generators or whatever. And they will pick the battery option and the solar option. And so this is a little bit damned if you do, damned if you don't situation for the LNG industry is that they're the, 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 the approach that they're trying to sell into emerging markets, if they're successful, I think it's going to be much more likely that the Chinese coal industry is going to walk away with the market. And if they're not successful, the solar and battery industry is going to walk away. I just don't see a middle scenario in which you do convince people that baseload is very, very, or like, you know, a, a firm capacity is very, very important and you shouldn't go for solar and batteries. But where you don't convince, where you also convince them people that they need to pick the more expensive options rather than the cheaper option that gives more energy security. And that is, I think, the, the, the real sort of, that's maybe the more complex version of the battle between the two powers. It's really a threefold power where China is almost building up this pincer movement around the West, where they're saying, we almost don't care if emerging economies pick for green or pick for dirty, uh, because they will pick for cheap. And so we have the solar and battery deal that they probably prefer. But if they still fall for the fossil lobby, they'll go for coal and we're there as well. And this is, I think, the, 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 the more complicated battle that we're seeing play out. Um, let's uh, wrap up our interview this way, uh, uh, Dan, and that is that uh, China, there's a China model of power grid, power sector that's emerging. And while China is still building power plants, uh, coal power plants, that is true, uh, what it's doing, it has an aging coal plant uh, fleet, and it's replacing some of those older plants with high efficiency uh, plants and of course you know because of their electric de electricity demand is growing so rapidly they they are still adding coal coal capacity but the point here is i've talked to a number of experts about on the chinese uh, on the power sector and they say the ultimate goal down the road now whether that's 20 40 50 60 70 it remains to be seen but the ultimate goal is that the grid will be 100 percent powered by uh, wind uh, solar batteries, hydro, and nukes. And then there will be these high capacity coal plants that will essentially be in reserve. And they brought in a capacity market, which basically is a, is a market where it allows idle power generation capacity to be paid for because nobody wants to build a plant that's just going to lose money, doesn't never get used. So it, it'll be there when it's required and then they've all, they set this all up and it's all, you can see the pieces in motion. That's the strategy. And you're already now seeing, I think, especially in Southeast Asia and other parts of Asia, uh, similar strategies emerge around the power sector, similar to what China is doing. And China is helping them in many cases. And, and part of this is because coal is so, so easy to store compared to other fuels. Like sort of in theory, it's not as easy as that, but you put some coal in the backyard with a tarp over it and it keeps <laughs> more or less, right? Compare that to natural gas where you need to get like salt cavern storage or other, it's, it's very expensive to store natural gas. So if you're looking for a complement to renewables in terms of, you know, Dunkelflaut, the worst week of the past like 20 years back up just in case, uh, to, to some extent, I mean, a gaseous fuel is, of course, always going to be harder to store than a liquid one or a solid one. So diesel backup generators or even for larger backup periods, coal power plants that are already paid off uh, are, of course, in that sense, much more economical than, for instance, if we consider in Europe, keeping all of our gas storages in Europe up and running for only those Dunkelflauta moments that are going to come maybe once a year uh, for, for like uh, a few hours and maybe once, a year, once every 30 years for like more than a couple of days in a row. And that's incredibly expensive. And that's why I think the, the, the coal play is coming back also in emerging economies. Not uh, capacity is built up, not for the volume, but for the backup. Um, and and it's still, I mean, it's still hard to see uh, in the moment that they're going to come online and run immediately at like six percent or ten percent uptime. They're going to run like at least sixty percent to start with, and it's I think it's smarter to go straight much more for a solar and battery system. But we shouldn't be, um, uh, from a climate point of view, we shouldn't be too worried looking at those plants coming online. I think because we need to appreciate them for what they are, which is uh, strategic backup. Also, just in case other things go wrong in the country. Um, this is a backup and reserve capacity that we can have with our own energy secure coal that we have in our own soil, or we can import and stockpile huge amounts of without uh, running into large costs. Well, Dan, uh, fascinating conversation. As always, thank you very much for this. Appreciate it. Thank you, Margaret.